Welcome. Today we shall review the special theory of relativity as well as a couple of consequences of the special theory of relativity in an astronomical context. Let us begin with Newton. Newton in his Principia not only stated his laws of motion but also his principle of relativity. Let us first begin with the laws of motion. The first law states that every body continues in a state of rest or of uniform motion in a right line unless it is compelled to change that state by forces impressed upon it. Mm -hmm. And the second law states the change of motion is proportional to the motive force impressed and is made in the direction of the right line in which that force is impressed. Now I want to convince you that although you have learned these things in school and know these by, by heart, that Newton's first law of motion is perhaps the most revolutionary statement ever made in the entire history of physics. Let me explain why. Let us start with the Aristotelian view. According to Aristotle, force is in some way associated with velocity. Whenever you have velocity, there must be a force which is responsible for this velocity. For example, what is responsible for the perpetual motion of the planets around the sun? When Kepler was asked this question, he is supposed to have replied, I don't know, I expect some angels are pushing the planets. Now this is what Newton said. According to Newton, velocity is something that persists without any cause. The velocity of the earth does not have to be explained. It is the acceleration of the earth that has to be explained. Newton's first law, as I said, is truly revolutionary. When a body is moving with a uniform or a constant velocity, never mind what that velocity is. It may be small or it may be big. As long as it is uniform, don't look for a force responsible for that motion. Don't go looking for a rope which is pulling that particle. <laughs> Newton's first law requires us to distinguish observers in uniform relative motion. Observers distinguish by this fact, namely, that each one considers the other as moving with a uniform velocity relative to one another, or called inertial observers. That all inertial observers agree on Newton's first law is actually a consequence from that law. Now let us take Newton's principle of relativity. Newton said, all inertial observers are equivalent as far as dynamical experiments are concerned. What he meant by this statement was that all inertial observers, observers who are moving with respect to each other with uniform or constant velocity, will agree on the laws of motion stated by him, the first law, the second law, and the third law. All observers, all inertial observers will agree on the laws of motion. Now the reason why this principle of relativity is restricted to dynamical experiments is that we have deduced all this on the basis of Newton's laws of dynamics. So once again, all inertial observers are equivalent as far as dynamical experiments are concerned. Now Einstein was very much bothered by this restriction to mechanics. He argued Newton's dynamics was established 
by looking in the direction of Earth's acceleration and seeing that in the direction of the acceleration is the sun. But seeing is part of optics. Therefore, Einstein was faced with two alternatives. The first alternative is remove restriction to mechanics or dynamical experiments and simply say that all inertial observers agree on the laws of physics. All laws of physics. Or the second alternative is say that this is not possible and therefore abandon Newton's principle of relativity. Now Einstein chose the first alternative. So let us state Einstein's principle of relativity. All laws of physics are invariant under transformations that take us from one inertial frame to another. All laws, all in capital letters, are not just laws of mechanics. But there was a problem. A few years earlier, 50 years earlier, Maxwell had shown that the velocity of light is constant and is absolute. This clearly did not fit into the principle of relativity. Why? Let us consider the status of space and time in classical mechanics. Here are two reference frames, k and k prime, moving with uniform velocity with respect to one another. According to Newton and Galileo before that, time and space are absolute concepts. Time interval between two events is independent of the motion of the body of reference. Similarly, space interval or the distance between two points on a rigid body is independent of the motion of the body. It follows that the laws of physics are invariant under Galilean transformation if time and space are absolute. What is Galilean transformation? Galilean transformation says if the frame k prime is moving with respect to the frame k with a uniform velocity v along the x direction, then x prime is equal to x minus vt, y prime and z prime remain unchanged, and so does t prime remain unchanged. This is the law of Galilean transformation between two inertial frames moving with respect to each other with the uniform relative velocity v. Now Maxwell's equations, as I said, stated that the velocity of light is constant and is absolute. Now one of the great mysteries about Maxwell's equation is that they are not invariant under this Galilean transformation. So Maxwell's equation somehow did not agree with the assumption that time and space are absolute. Maxwell did not dwell on that. But the great Dutch physicist, Lawrence, was bothered by this. And he tried to find out under what transformation Maxwell's equation are invariant. If it is not Galilean transformation, are there some transformation which take you from one inertial frame to another under which Maxwell's equations are invariant? And he did this by trial and error. And he found a remarkable set of transformations which now bears his name, Lorentz transformation. What Henrik Lorentz discovered was that if x and t were related to x prime and t prime, not according to Galilean transformation, but according to this law, namely x prime is equal to x minus vt divided by square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared, and t prime is equal to t minus vx by c squared, divided by square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared, y prime remains equal to y, z prime remains equal to z, 
because the two frames are moving along the x direction relative to one another, then he found that Maxwell's equation remained invariant under these transformations, this set of transformations. Now, Lorentz noted that when the velocity of light was very small compared to the velocity of the particle or the frame of reference, then v squared by c squared can be neglected in the denominator and v by c in the numerator here can be neglected and you will get back Galilean transformation which is x prime equal to x minus vt, y prime equal to y, z prime is equal to z and t prime is equal to t. Therefore, to repeat, the Lorentz transformation, mysterious transformation under which Maxwell's equation were invariant, reduces to Galilean transformation when the velocity of light goes to infinity or when the velocity of the frame or the particle is very small compared to the speed of light. Now this was an ad hoc uh, statement. Lorentz did not have any basis for why this law of transformation should obtain. Now let's go back to Einstein's principle of relativity. It says that the laws of physics are invariant in the transformation that take us from one inertial frame to another. But Einstein realized that there was a serious problem with this theory of relativity or this principle of relativity if one accepts Maxwell's statement that the velocity of light is uniform and constant. In other words, it's absolute. He noticed that in order for the principle of relativity to be true, in spite of Maxwell's assertions about the absoluteness of velocity of light, he, Einstein, had to abandon two well-known notions in physics, namely the concept of absolute time and absolute space. He realized that the moment you abandon the notion of absolute time, you will also have to abandon the notion of simultaneity of events. Previously, according to Galilean transformation, if two events are simultaneous with respect to one inertial observer, then all inertial observers will agree that those two events will be simultaneous. Now, Einstein felt that this simply cannot be true if the principle of relativity as well as Maxwell were both right. This immediately required Einstein to deal with space and time not as disjoint entities, but in a unified manner. Now, this is the thought experiment that Einstein did. I'm sure you're well aware of it, but let's repeat this experiment. Because this is all that Einstein needed to say that you have got to abandon the principle of simultaneity of events. So what is the thought experiment? Here is a railway station platform. And here is a moving train which is moving with a uniform velocity v from left to right. At some instant of time, there are three points, A, M, and B. M is exactly midway between A and B. There are three points, A, midpoint and B, which are coincident with the points A prime, M prime, and B prime in the moving train. In other words, at that particular instant that I am showing you, the train is moving along, but that, at that particular incident, A prime is coincident with A, M prime is coincident with M, B prime is coincident with B. Remember, the platform is stationary, the train is moving with a uniform velocity. At that moment, at this moment, when these two sets of coordinates are coincident, a lightning strikes A and B simultaneous. In other words, a person in the platform says that a lightning has struck in A and B simultaneously. 
How does he know that? He puts two 45 degree mirrors in A and M, B, and reflects the lightning to the midpoint M. And what he finds is that the light reflected from the mirror at A and the mirror at B will reach the midpoint at exactly the same time. That is how he knows that the lightning struck A and B simultaneously. Very good. Now let us ask, does the person on the train consider the lightning to have struck A prime and B prime simultaneously? Remember, A prime, B prime, and M prime are points in the train, moving train, coincident with A, B, and M when the lightning strikes. But as soon as the lightning strikes, the train is moving. Now, the, the, the physicist on the train also has a mirror in A prime, mirror in B prime, and he reflects the lightning towards the point M prime. Now, all these points A prime, M prime, B prime are moving. In particular, M prime is moving. Therefore, from the, the, the lightning having struck A prime and reflected by a 45 degree mirror, we'll have to travel a longer distance to reach M prime. And the lightning reflected from a 45 degree mirror at B prime will have to travel a shorter distance to reach M prime because M prime is moving in towards the right. Therefore, to repeat, signal from A prime on the train, on the moving train, will take longer to reach M prime than signal from B prime if the velocity of light is absolute. According to Galilean and Newtonian physics, velocity of light depends on the velocity of the source. So since this mirror in A prime itself is moving with the velocity V, light will travel with the velocity V plus C. And since this mirror is moving in the other direction, the velocity will be C minus V. The velocity of light depends on the velocity of the source or the mirror. But not if the velocity is absolute as demanded by um, Maxwell. Therefore, whereas in the pre-Maxwell era, A prime and B prime would have also considered the lightning to have struck simultaneously at A prime and B prime, post-Maxwell, the observers in A prime and uh, B prime will conclude that the lightning did not strike simultaneously because the light reflected does not reach M prime at the same time. Therefore, let's repeat. Lightning strikes A and B simultaneously. Light reflected from A and B will reach the midway point M at the same time. Therefore, the lightning has struck simultaneously A and B. But A prime and B prime and M prime are points on the moving train coincident with A, B, and M when the lightning actually strikes. But M prime is moving with the train. Therefore, signal from A prime on the train will take longer to reach M prime than signal from B prime will take to reach M prime. Therefore, what is the conclusion? Conclusion is that events which are simultaneous with respect to the platform are not simultaneous with respect to a uniformly moving train. So the, the moment you say the velocity of light is absolute, it follows in a rigorous fashion that events which are simultaneous in one frame are not necessarily simultaneous to other inertial observers. Mm -hmm. So if one discards the notion of absoluteness of simultaneity, the conflict between the law of propagation of light in vacuum, namely that the velocity of light is absolute, and the principle of relativity, the contradiction simply disappears. Similarly, the relativity of distance also has to be accepted. In other words, if you abandon the notion of absoluteness of space, 
By a similar thought experiment, Einstein concluded that the distance between two points is not invariant with respect to all inertial observers. Therefore, all laws of physics are invariant in the transformation that take us from one inertial frame to another. And in any given inertial frame, the velocity of light C is the same whether the light is emitted by a body at rest or by a body in uniform motion. So these are the two pillars on which the theory of relativity is erected by Einstein. These are the two principles. And then Einstein abandoned the absoluteness of space and time. He discovered the law of transformation between inertial frames or indeed the Lorentz transformation which Lorentz had discovered by trial and error to see under which transformation Maxwell's equation remained invariant. So Einstein recovered Lorentz transformation. It's a natural transformation between two inertial frames the moment you abandon the notion of absoluteness of space and absoluteness of time. These laws of transformation due to Einstein and Lorentz, rather Lorentz and Einstein, reduced to the Galilean transformation when V is very much less than C, which is the Newtonian limit. Now, what are the results of the special theory of relativity that Einstein constructed based on those two principles? One is that the Lorentz transformation are recovered, the transformation that takes you from one inertial frame to another, under which all laws of physics remain invariant. The length of a moving rod, rigid rod, appears smaller. Moving clocks tick slower. The law of addition of velocities is V1 plus V2 divided by 1 plus V1 V2 divided by C squared not simply V1 plus V2. And the energy of a moving body, E is equal to mc squared, where m is the mass of the particle, which is related to the rest mass m0 by this formula m0 c squared divided by 1 minus square root of v squared by c squared. Now, what is proper time? Proper time is the time that is recorded by a moving clock in its frame. So let there be two frames k and k prime where the coordinates are x t and x prime and t prime. And the frame k prime is moving with respect to k with the uniform velocity v in the x direction. And let delta t prime equal to t2 prime minus t2 prime be the time interval between two ticks of a clock in this moving frame. Then what is the time at which the clocks are tick, uh, seen to be ticking according to the frame k? They are t1 and t2, which are given by Lorentz transformation that I wrote down in the previous slide. And if you take the difference, you find that the Time interval between two ticks of a clock in the stationary frame is equal to the time interval between two ticks of the clock in the moving frame divided by 1 minus v squared by c squared. And since this number can be uh, significant, these two are different. And this is the phenomena that moving clocks tick slower. Delta T is always less than delta T prime. Now, I want to discuss some astrophysical implications of this basic principle of relativity. Let us consider the familiar Doppler shift. Here is a clock at A, and the clock is moving in this direction with a uniform velocity v. And out here is an observer at a distance d from the clock. And the clock is moving 
in a direction which makes an angle theta with respect to the line joining the initial position of the clock and the observer. Now let this moving clock emit two ticks, tick, tick, and let the first tick be emitted when the clock was at A, and let the second tick be emitted when the clock reached the point B. And let the time interval between the two ticks be delta T prime in the clock's frame, in the moving clock's frame. Now let T1 and T2 be the arrival times of these two ticks at the observer who is at a distance D from the point A. So T1 and T2 are the two times when the observer hears tick and tick. Now, when will the first tick reach the observer? Let the, let the first tick be emitted at time t equal to zero. Then similarly, so clearly, the time t1 will be just the distance d divided by the speed of light. So the first tick will reach after a time t1, which is given by this simple expression. Now, when will the second tick reach the observer? The second tick will reach the observer First of all, it will reach the observer later for two reasons. One is the second tick itself is emitted afterwards by the moving clock after a time delta T prime. And that delta T prime is related to delta T of the observer by this Lorentz transformation law, which is delta T divided by square root of 1 minus V squared by C squared. So this is what you, this is the time you would expect the second tick to reach the observer. Not quite. That tick has to travel a certain distance. Fortunately, it has to travel a smaller distance. Why? It doesn't have to travel a distance d, but it has to travel a distance d minus v delta t prime cos theta because the clock has moved closer to us by the time it emitted the second tick. Therefore, there is a second time, term, which is the distance traveled by the second tick, which is the distance between that point and the observer, which is d minus v cos theta delta t prime, and delta t prime is delta t divided by 1 over square root of v squared by c squared, <clears throat> the whole thing divided by c. So this is the time when the second tick will reach the observer. So these are the two terms. So here it is for your convenience. The first tick emitted by the clock at point A will reach after a time D over C. The second tick will reach the observer after this time. Therefore, the difference between T2 and T1 is simply delta t multiplied by 1 minus v cos theta divided by square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared. That is simply by subtracting from this, this first term. d over c cancels out. Please verify this elementary algebra. So I have repeated this formula here for your convenient reference. So if delta t is the time interval between two ticks of a clock which is moving towards the observer making an angle theta. Then the time interval between the two ticks as measured by the observer's clock are related by this relation and this is just Doppler shift. Now instead of writing it in terms of the time difference between the ticking of the clock I can take the reciprocal of this and get an expression for the frequency. Then I get the famous Doppler's formula. If mu is the frequency emitted by a moving atom or a moving clock, and mu observed is the frequency measured by the observer, then mu observed and mu em are related by this formula in the yellow box. 
Now, when you have studied Doppler shift in sound and for electromagnetic waves in Newtonian mechanics, this numerator would not be there. That is because you are dealing with velocities which are very small compared to the speed of light. Therefore, this second term can be neglected and you get back the original familiar Doppler's formula, which is delta nu by nu is equal to delta lambda by lambda is equal to V over C, where V is the velocity in the direction of motion, which is V cos theta then V is a vector along that direction, V cos theta is the radial velocity. So that is Doppler shift formula pre-written here for your convenience. Now there is something very interesting about this formula. Normally, you are familiar with Doppler shift only when the source is moving towards the observer or moving away from the observer and there is a radial component of that velocity. If the source of light or sound is moving in the direction perpendicular, then there is no shift in frequency. But in this case, there will be because even if cos theta is 90 degrees and cos 90 is zero, the denominator becomes this unity, but the numerator is still there. Therefore, new observed and new emitter are related by factor square root of 1 minus v squared, and this is known as transverse Doppler effect. So, in relativity, there is Doppler effect even if the source of light is moving perpendicular to the line of sight. Now, why are these considerations important? Why am I digressing into these things? In fact, why am I reviewing the special theory of relativity at all? Because in the world we live in, we know that special theory of relativity is utterly unimportant because all velocities are incredibly small compared to the speed of light. The sun, the earth is moving around the sun with a velocity of 30 kilometers per second. The sun is going around the galaxy with a velocity of 220 kilometers per second. So we know that special relativity is totally unimportant, not only in the world we live in, but certainly not in the astronomical context where the velocities are even less. Special theory of relativity, as we all know from books, is only important in the realm of elementary particles, which move with speeds close to the speed of light. But this is not quite true, because much of contemporary astrophysics deals with particles and sources which move with speeds considerably close to the speed of light. Therefore, the, SS, the effects of special relativity become extremely important. And this indeed is the reason why I am digressing into a review of the special theory of relativity. For example, one of the sources of radiation, as we shall see, is when a particle gyrates in a magnetic field. When a charge gyrates in a magnetic field, it emits electromagnetic radiation. Now, if that particle is a relativistic particle, then it's called synchrotron radiation. Now, many astronomical sources, like supernova remnants, say the Crab Nebula, quasars, pulsars, etc., emit synchrotron radiation from relativistic electrons. And the spectrum of this radiation the angular pattern of this radiation, the polarization of this radiation will be drastically different from the radiation emitted by non-relativistic particles. Therefore, Lorentz transformation of angles and intensities become extremely important. And the formula that I just discussed become extremely relevant. Now, not only the particles are moving with speed comparable to the speed of light, but the plasma inside which the particles are moving, the plasma blob itself may be moving, may be ejected by a black hole at enormous speeds comparable to the speed of light. In that case, the distance between the blob and the observer is changing with time. Not by very much, but definitely changing with time. In such a context, 
the formula that I derived for Doppler shift of frequencies and the Doppler shift of the rate of ticking of a clock become extremely important. For example, there will be a difference between the power emitted and the power received. A plasma blob ejected by a black hole says, I emitted so many watts of power, so many joules in so many seconds according to my clock. But that will not be the power that you measure for two reasons. First of all, the rate of ticking of the blob's clock is different from the late rate of ticking of your clock. And secondly, the blob has been moving towards you. Therefore, there will be a difference between what the blob claims as the power it emitted and what you would claim as an observer as the power received. So I'm just giving you an example of a situation in contemporary high energy astrophysics where the results of special relativity are extremely important. So let me give you two such examples. One is the Doppler boosting of intensity or surface brightness. You remember the concept from the second lecture of the specific intensity I knew. It is the energy crossing a unit area per unit time in frequency interval d nu going into a solid angle d omega which is normal to the surface. Please remember the units. It is the energy crossing a unit area per unit time per unit frequency interval going into a solid angle d omega. Time transforms, frequencies transform, angles transform because the ratio of x over y and x over z transform from one inertial frame to another. Therefore, the, the notion of surface brightness is not invariant. It will change depending upon which inertial frame you are in. Now, one of the things that I stated in that lecture, second lecture, without proving, is that although the specific intensity is not invariant when you go from one inertial frame to another, because time interval, frequency interval, and angles change. But I knew over new cube is a Lorentz invariant. I did not prove that to you, but please accept this as a true statement. Therefore, if I knew is the specific intensity emitted by a moving source at a frequency nu, and if I knew prime is the specific intensity measured in another frame at a frequency nu prime, which is the Doppler shifted frequency corresponding to nu, then I knew and I knew prime are related by this expression over here. That just follows from I knew over nu cubed is a constant. I knew over nu cube is equal to I prime nu prime divided by nu prime cube. And that can be written in shorthand notation by introducing d cube, where d is shorthand for square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared divided by 1 minus v cos theta. Now, imagine source which is moving with a velocity which is 97% the speed of light. Gamma, which is 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared will be equal to 4 for this value of beta. And the Doppler boost factor d cube can be as large as a thousand. Therefore, the surface brightness will look very different for the observer. Now let us consider a source, a quasar or a black hole, emitting two relativistic jets. And let us say one jet is moving in your direction, the other jet is moving in the direction away from you. Not directly towards you and directly away from you, but making an angle theta so that there is a radial component of the velocity. And let us say the surface brightness, S1 and S2, 
or the surface brightness of the jet that is approaching you and the jet that is receding from you. They are related by this formula, 1 plus beta cos theta divided by 1 minus beta cos theta. Where does this come from? You remember, V is a vector and V cos theta is the radial component of the velocity in the direction of line of sight. Therefore, it will be 1 minus V cos theta if the jet is moving roughly in your direction. But if the jet is moving roughly in the opposite direction, then V cos theta will have a minus sign and this 1 minus V by C cos theta will become 1 plus V cos theta. So that is why this 1 plus B, beta is just V over C. 1 plus beta cos theta and 1 minus beta cos theta comes by taking the ratio between I nu and I nu prime. And that is raised to a certain power n, which is of the order of 2 and a half. Don't worry about that at the moment. All I want you to appreciate is that the surface brightness of the jet that is moving towards you will be very different from the surface jet of surface brightness of the jet that's moving away from you, and the ratio of the surface brightnesses can be as large as a thousand or even a million. Here is an example of a jet emitted by a quasar. One jet is moving in our direction, the other jet is moving in the other direction. You see the difference in surface brightnesses are so enormous that you don't even see the other jet. This is known as Doppler favoritism. In other words, even though there are two jets emitted by the black hole, you only see the one that is coming towards you because its surface brightness has been boosted by the Doppler shift of the frequencies. This, in fact, was predicted by Martin Rees, now Lord Rees, and his former student, Roger Blanford, now a most distinguished astrophysicist, they not only predicted that active galactic nuclei such as this will emit jets, they predicted that the jets will be relativistic and that one jet will be much brighter than the other. They also predicted the phenomena of superluminal motion, meaning motions faster than the speed of light. Now you'll say, well here, before we go to that, here is another example of the galaxy Cygnus A. You see this jet very faint compared to this jet which is more prominent. So this jet is presumably coming towards us and the other jet is moving away from you. Now you'll say the notion of superluminal motion is nonsense because I've just told you about the principle of relativity which says nothing can move with a speed greater than the speed of light. The answer is yes and no. What you see need not be what actually is. So this, these are apparent superluminal motions. Let's go back to a moving clock. This time it's a moving blob. Let us say that there is a black hole at the location A and the, and the black hole ejects a blob, a giant plasma blob which radiates and we detect the radiation. And let us say that that blob is ejected along this direction, making an angle theta with the observer who is here at a distance d from the black hole. And let the blob be moving with a uniform velocity v. And let us say the blob starts at a, which is, it is ejected at time t equal to zero. After time delta t, it reaches the point b, the blob. Remember the black hole is stationary. It is the blob ejected by the black hole that you're seeing continuously and it has moved along to the point b after a time delta t. How far has that blob moved towards you? it has moved that distance, and that distance is V delta T multiplied by cosine of this angle cos theta. But that doesn't concern us. What concerns us is this motion in the transverse direction. When we saw the blob first, it was over there. And when we see the blob now, it is over there in the sky. So in the sky, 
the blob has moved a distance v delta t times sin theta in this direction. In what time has the blob moved this distance? It has moved, it moved this distance in a time delta t. So let's repeat. The blob travels a distance v delta t and reaches the position b. Light from A and B reaches the observer at time T1 and time T2, which are given by this simple formula. T1 is D by C, where D is the distance of the black hole. And T2, when the blob is over here, the light from the blob reaching us, that time is T2, is delta t, after all, you have to wait till the blob gets here, plus the light travel time from b to over here. Light travel time is the distance travel, which is d minus b delta t cos theta. Already in that time, the blob has moved this much distance towards us, so you have to subtract it from d, so it is d minus v, d minus v delta t cos theta divided by c. Therefore, the apparent velocity of motion from A to B, apparent velocity in the sky, is V delta T sine theta, that distance, divided by the time interval T2 minus T1. Now, if I introduce the variable beta, which is V over C, then beta apparent is equal to beta sine theta divided by 1 minus beta cos theta. Because this delta t and t1, t2 minus t1 cancels out. So beta apparent is beta sine theta divided by 1 minus beta cos theta. So I have rewritten the formula here so that you can see it as we proceed with the argument. So, let me repeat what this formula is saying. A black hole emits a blob at the point A at a time zero, and the blob travels and reaches the point B after time delta t. The apparent velocity, this distance divided by the time interval, is beta sine theta divided by 1 minus beta cos theta. Now, clearly, the value of the apparent velocity depends on the value of theta, if I fix the value of beta. So if the angle is small or if the angle is very large, then this factor will be very different and the apparent velocities will be very different. So let us say beta is fixed. And then you ask, for what value of theta will this apparent velocity have a maximum? Well, you have to differentiate the right-hand side with respect to theta, set it equal to zero, and solve that simple equation. And if you do that, it should take you a few seconds, you will find that the apparent velocity beta apparent has a maximum when cos theta is equal to beta. Please verify this. It shouldn't take you more than two minutes. Then you find, if you substitute that, you find that the maximum value of this apparent velocity of the blob in the sky is gamma times beta, where gamma is 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared. When v becomes comparable to c, gamma becomes very large. Gamma of a relativistic particle can be a thousand, it can be a million, it can be 10 to the power 9, depending on the, how close the speed is to the speed of light. Therefore, the apparent velocity can be very, very large indeed, compared to the velocity of light. So here is a plot. What is plotted on the y-axis is V over C, the apparent velocity divided by velocity of light. And what is plotted here is the angle theta. Theta is the angle made between the direction of emission of the blob and the direction from the black hole to the observer. And these various plots are for various angles. Clearly, when, when 
beta becomes very large, then the peaking, the apparent velocity becomes very, very large for small angles. For example, when beta is 0.99, or the velocity is 99% uh, the speed of light, then V over C is seven times the speed of light. The apparent velocity is seven times the speed of light. Here, the apparent velocity is 10 times the speed of light. Here, the apparent velocity is 15 times the speed of light. Now you say, look, this is all mathematics. I don't believe in a word of it because nothing can travel faster than light. But here it is. Here is a jet emitted by the giant black hole M87, which I referred to in the very first lecture. The giant black hole has been imaged by radio astronomers, and we saw that beautiful image of the shadow of the black hole. That black hole constantly emits blobs of gas. So here is a blob of gas it emitted in 1994. In 1995, it has moved that distance in the sky. In 96, it has moved over there. 97, it has moved over there. 98, it has moved over there. So if I draw a line and calculate uh, the apparent velocity in the sky, you find that the apparent velocity far exceeds the speed of light. Here is another example of a quasar 3C279. Here is a blob expanding from 1992 to 1995. If I draw a line here and calculate the apparent velocity, you will find that the apparent velocity is superluminal motion. Now, in the remaining few minutes, I want to change gears, go back to the special theory of relativity of Einstein and say something which is extremely basic and which Einstein did not state. And that concerns the geometry of special relativity. Now, this discussion is extremely important in the context of the general theory of relativity, which I shall describe in the next lecture. Our story begins with Hermann Minkowski, who was one of Einstein's teachers when he was a student in Zurich in Switzerland. In 1907, Hermann Minkowski moved from Zurich and became a professor in the famous university in Göttingen where the famous mathematician Hilbert was also there, where in earlier times the greatest of them all, Carl Friedrich Gauss and then Riemann and a galaxy of mathematicians were in earlier times. On the 5th of November 1907, Hermann Minkowski gave a colloquium, and he began this colloquia, colloquium with these prophetic words, and I shall read them out for you. The views of space and time which I wish to lay before you have sprung from the soil of experimental physics, and therein lie their strength. They are radical, henceforth space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows, and only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. And then in that colloquium, Minkowski went on to define his concept of space-time and the geometry of space-time of special relativity. Now, before, space, before Minkowski, people did talk of space-time. It is space versus time. You draw x in this direction and time in this direction, or x and y in that direction and time in this direction. So, for example, these are spatial sections. These are x and y coordinates. I cannot show you z coordinate because I'm using that for the time coordinate. These are sections of space at various times. For example, if there is a particle moving 
in that direction, then the particle was here in space at that x and y coordinate at noon day before yesterday. It was over here at noon yesterday. It will be here at noon tomorrow. And it will be here at noon day after tomorrow. So this was the notion of space-time. Space-time was simply space plotted against time. But that's not what Minkowski space-time is. It's a very profound concept and very seldom taught in colleges and very seldom appreciated. So I would like to tell you exactly what Minkowski said. And it's very important that you understand this and you absorb this in order to appreciate the general theory of relativity in the next lecture. Now, what is Minkowski's notion of space-time? It has nothing to do with real space and real time plotted. It is a fictitious mathematic mathematical four-dimensional space. It's a fictitious space. What are the points in that space? Every point in that space-time is an event. That event is specified by three space coordinates, x, y, and z, and a time coordinate, t, or c times t, where c is the speed of light. Why c comes in, you'll see in a minute. What do I mean by that? Now, suppose you take a sheet of paper, just as a continuum of points defines a plane in Euclidean geometry, a plane is just a continuum of points. In a similar fashion, the collection of all events defines space-time continuum. Selection, collection of all events that have taken place? No. Collection of all events, past, present, and future. All past events, all the present events, all the future events that will occur in this universe, those are the points in the space-time. So it is a once-and-for-all picture of the physical world. Space-time doesn't change with time. It represents past till infinity and future till infinity and the present. Nothing happens in this fictitious mathematical space-time. A physical particle in real space, for example, is described by giving the locus of all events that occur right at the particle. For example, at this time, at this place, this particle collided with another particle. At this time and this place, this particle split into two. These are physical events. They represent points in Minkowski space-time. Goings on in the physical world, our real physical world, are described by geometrical structures within space-time. So there are, there are curves and cones and straight lines in Minkowski space-time. Those geometrical constructions represent real physical events in our physical world. Now let's consider two points in Minkowski space-time. What is the distance between these two points? What is the interval between these two events? Now, Minkowski argued that that interval, S12, 1, 1 is event 1 and 2 is event 2, is given by the square root under square bracket of c squared t2 minus t1 whole squared minus x2 minus x1 whole squared plus y2 minus y1 whole squared plus z2 minus z1 whole squared. This sounds very familiar, right? What are t1, t2, and so on? t1, x1, y1, and z1 are the coordinates of event 1. And similarly, x2, y2, z2, and t2 are the coordinates of event 2. And this is the time interval between the two. Now, Minkowski asserted that this time interval between two events is the same in all inertial frames of reference. 
It is invariant under Lorentz transformations that take you under from one inertial frame to another. That is because Hermann Minkowski argued this is something that Einstein had certainly not appreciated. Minkowski showed that Lorentz transformation is merely a rotation in his space-time. And since the distance between two points remains invariant under the rotation of the coordinate system, if I have two coordinates x and y, and if I have two points a and b, if I rotate the coordinate system, the distance between point a and b remains invariant. And since Lorentz transformations are mere rotations in Minkowski space-time, the distance between uh, the time interval between two events remains invariant under Lorentz transformation. So all inertial observers will agree on this. Therefore, there is something absolute about the interval between events. Time and space are not absolute. What is absolute are intervals between the events. Now, the geometry of Minkowski's four-dimensional space is pseudo-Euclidean. Please remember that if this was Euclidean, there would be a plus sign over there because the distance between two points in four-dimensional space would be x2 minus x1 whole square plus y2 minus y1 whole square plus z2 minus z1 whole square plus the fourth coordinate difference whole square. So the geometry is not Euclidean, there has to be a plus sign, but it is pseudo-Euclidean. So Minkowski suggested that in the absence of gravity, a space-time of special relativity has a non-Euclidean geometry, but it is just a pseudo-Euclidean geometry. It is still a plane geometry, but it is pseudo-Euclidean. It is not Cartesian geometry. Now, according to Herbert Minkowski, if there is a flash of light over here at the origin, this is coordinate x and coordinate ct of space-time, then light signals travel with the absolute velocity, so they travel on the surface of this cone, and this is the past light cone, this is the future light cone, because he argued that all events here are future events, and all events here are past events, and they, these are absolute concepts which all inertial observers will agree upon. Now, Minkowski's space-time differs from the ordinary notion of space-time, and indeed Einstein's notion of space-time, in a very essential manner. And that can be illustrated by this beautiful example that Sir Arthur Eddington wrote in his very famous book on general relativity, written way back as soon as the theory was published. Here is a stack of papers, a thousand sheets of paper. Now, here is a block, a solid block of paper from a pulp factory. I can slice this paper block into sheets of paper. That is how sheets of paper are made. Now, I don't have to slice this block of paper in this direction. Like I have a bread which has not been sliced by my bakery, I can bring it home, I can slice the block this way, or I can slice the block anywhere that I like. So different observers have a right to slice this solid block of paper in any manner they like. And so it is in Minkowski space-time. This is space-time. Two coordinates are x and y, and the third coordinate is time. So one inertial observer says that I am going to define my time axis in that direction. Therefore, my space sections at various times are perpendicular to the time axis. So these sheets, horizontal sheets, represent space sections at various times. But another inertial observer in a different inertial frame may say, no, 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 no. I am going to slice my space-time so that the space sections are like this. And I am going to define my time 
in a perpendicular direction over there. A third inertial observer may say, no, 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 I, I'm going to do it very differently. I'm going to define that as my time direction, and therefore my space directions will be perpendicular to that. Who is right? Minkowski said, they're all right. That is the principle of relativity. You can define space and time coordinates any way that you like. But there are certain things which are absolute, that all observers will agree. These are the geometrical structures that are in Minkowski space-time. Now, to conclude this lecture, I would like to give this remarkable example of uh, the meaning of relativity, and this is due to the great Sir Roger Penrose, who, as you know, was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics uh, uh, two years ago. Now, two walkers, A and B, happen to meet, let us say, near the Big Ben clock in London, next to the Houses of Parliament, the Big Ben clock which chimes every hour. But Walker A defines time in a certain way, and Walker B defines time in his own way. But they happen to meet at the point, at this point, at a certain time. Now here is Andromeda galaxy, whose time evolves along this magenta curve. And let us say that that time in Andromeda galaxy, there is a supernova explosion. Now this Walker A defines his time in that direction. Therefore, his space section will be perpendicular to that, which is what I have indicated over there. And therefore, all events on this plane are simultaneous according to Walker A. They occur at the same time as measured by his clock. And one of the events that he will measure is this supernova in Andromeda galaxy. Very good. Now let's go to Walker B, who is at the same point under the Big Ben. The two walkers are crossing there. But Walker B chooses to define time in that direction and his space is perpendicular to that time direction, which is indicated by this red rectangle. Now, to the Walker B, all events on this plane are simultaneous because they occur at the same time according to Walker B's wristwatch. But you notice that the supernova in Andromeda galaxy is not one of the events that is simultaneous for him because the supernova occurred for Walker A at this time. This is Walker B, this is Walker A, this is Walker B, this is Walker A, this is Walker B. Now, let's put the two together. So, walkers A and B meet here under the Big Ben. Walker A defines his time A that way, and his space section is perpendicular to that. That is a square rectangle. Walker B defines time this way, and his space section is perpendicular to that, which is a red rectangle. According to Walker A, all events, the event X and A are simultaneous because they are on the plane, which is the white rectangle. According to Walker B, events X and B are simultaneous. Therefore, you see, whereas A will say that the supernova in Andromeda galaxy occurred when I was under the Big Ben, Walker B will say, no, when I was under the Big Ben at the same time as Walker A, there was no supernova in Andromeda galaxy. Something else happened in Andromeda galaxy. Therefore, Minkowski space-time is a very important concept to really understand Einstein's special theory of relativity in a deep manner. 
which Einstein had not stated in his theory of special relativity. It is Minkowski who said that space-time provides an objective geometry that is not dependent on any particular observer that is invariant under Lorentz transformation. And as the great Sir Roger Penrose put it, what Minkowski did was to take relativity out of special relativity theory. And he presented us with an absolute picture of spatio-temporal activity. Now, I'm sure this is perhaps the first time you've heard of this notion of Minkowski space-time. So you need to go back and review this video till you have understood this properly. One person who was not impressed by all this was Einstein. He was not at all impressed with Minkowski's idea. He repeatedly scoffed them wherever he went around the world giving lectures in America, in Japan, and so on. He called it superfluous learnedness in German, which meant unnecessary mathematics, which obscured the beauty of relativity. Einstein was completely wrong. The true beauty of relativity can only be appreciated in the geometrical construction of Minkowski. As we shall see in the next lecture, Einstein was to change his views five years later in 1912 when he was in Prague. Indeed, Minkowski's insight into the geometrical structure of special relativity was the key to the discovery of general relativity. It is on that principle that we shall see that Einstein constructed the general theory of relativity, which we shall discuss in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.